Hi, um, this is Deborah Miles. I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about the terminology of statistics that's given in section 1.1 and 1.2. Um, section 1.1 is titled Review and Preview. The main thing you need to get from 1.1 is just the definition of statistics. Statistics is the science of planning studies and experiments, obtaining data, and then organizing, summarizing, presenting, analyzing, interpreting, and drawing conclusions based on the data. Um, basically, we have to make sure that the study is set up correctly. If our sample is not representative of the population that we're studying, then any results that we obtain are not going to be a um, valid. Once we sh are sure that we have the experiment set up well, then we need to think of different ways to organize and present our data. In chapter um, two, we're going to talk about different types of statistical graphs to display data. Um, then later in the course, we're going to talk about using statistics from samples to make predictions about a population. If we wanted to know the average credit card debt of um, Americans, American adults, we probably couldn't ask every American adult. So we would have to take a sample, make sure that our sample was representative of the population, and then um, correctly process the data so that once we found the average credit card debt of our sample, we could use it to predict the average credit card debt of the um, an adult American, an American adult, sorry. Um, so it's a scientific process, just like the scientific method. We have to learn to use it correctly so that whatever um, claims we make, whatever predictions we make, they're valid based on good solid data. Speaking of which, let's talk about data. Data can be a collection of observations, any measurements, gender, survey responses. Um, the population is the complete collection of all individuals to be studied. The collection is complete in the sense that it calls Cause includes all of the individuals to be studied. In other words, the example I was just mentioning, if we were trying to predict the average credit card debt for an adult American, then the population would be all adult Americans. This, these two sections really have a lot of terminology that are key to the rest of the course. Um, it might be a good idea to make some flashcards or a study guide to learn this terminology, but these are the words that we'll be using the entire rest of the semester. A census is a collection of data from every member of a population, whereas a sample is a sub-collection of members selected from a population. Very often we can't take a census because we can't contact every member of the population. That's why we use samples to make predictions about the population. You need to be able to correctly identify um, a population. First example in my notes, in a poll conducted by the Gallup Corporation, 1,013 adults in the U.S. were randomly selected and surveyed about identity theft. Results showed that 66% of the respondents worried about identity theft either frequently or occasionally. What's the population being studied? Who is it that we're trying to make a prediction about? Well, the Gallup Corporation was surveying a thousand adults in the U.S., so we're trying to make a prediction about adults in the U.S. That is our population. Is the 1,013 respondents the population or the sample? Well, that's definitely not all U.S. adults, so that's just a sample. And how could a census have been conducted? Well, the only way to um, conduct a census, by definition of census, is to contact every member of the population. Which is quite often impossible to do. 
All right, that's the terminology, not much of it in 1.1. 1 .1. In 1 1.2, it's all about statistical and critical thinking. You're going to see that um, you don't have to have a tremendous background in algebra to do the level of statistics that we're going to be talking about this semester. As a matter of, matter of fact, it's almost less of a math course and more of a critical thinking course. This is going to be all about reading a problem, determining what information is given to you, um, what information you need to find, and then we're just going to let the calculator do the statistical processing for us. I'm going to show you how to use um, every statistical function that we need right on a TI-83 or 84. That's why you need to get one right, at, right away. The biggest thing that you need to do as far as math, basic math, you need to be able to change fractions to decimals to percents. You need to be able to find things like 75% of 3,000. We'll talk about problems like that later in this lecture. But um, really, this course requires more common sense than mathematical expertise. You need to learn the vocabulary and how to think critically about statistics. The key elements in a statistical study. Um, there are three key elements. You need to prepare for the statistical study by considering the context of the data. Context means, what is this data? I have a bunch of numbers. Um, are they freshman GPAs or are they basketball jerseys numbers? Um, the source of the data, where did it come from? Was the study unbiased or self-interested? Is there someone who stands to profit from this study based on the results of the study? For example, um, a study that proves chocolate is good for your heart if that spot if that study is paid for by the hershey's company then maybe it's biased maybe it's a self-interest study and we should question the results of that study we need to think about sampling method and how to make sure that our sample is representative of the population one of the types of samples that we'll talk about that's not good is a voluntary response study or a self-selected study when the members choose whether or not to be part of the study. For example, if you post a survey on a website and just say, click here to take a survey, well, only people who have a vested interest or feel strongly about whatever topic is being surveyed would even click that button. So those folks are choosing to be in the study, and you need to think about whether or not they are representative of the general population, or maybe they care more about the um, particular topic than the average citizen does. Once you've set up the study correctly, you analyze the data. You analyze it by graphing. We'll talk about different kinds of graphs. Um, we'll look at different characteristics of the data as we explore it. We'll look at measures of center, measures of center such as mean, median, and mode. Um, we'll also talk about sometimes not only do we need to know the mean, we need to know how the data is spread out about the mean. That's called measures of distribution, and we'll talk about it later. Um, but we have to explore the data, and then we will apply all the statistical methods that we learned this semester and do almost all of them on a TI-83 or 84. So we prepare for a study, we analyze our data, and then we make conclusions. These two terms on the screen are two that um, sometimes give students trouble, so I want to make sure you understand the difference between statistical significance and practical significance. To answer the question, are these results statistically significant, significant you just need to look at the probability uh, or likelihood of those results occurring by chance. If results are unlikely, highly unlikely to occur by chance, 
then they're statistically significant. It causes you to think, hmm, something's going on here. For example, if you were betting on whether a coin would land on heads or tails, and you watched a person in front of you make the same bet, and you observe that 90 times out of 100, the coin landed on heads, that is not likely to happen by chance. That would make you think, this is not a fair coin. Those results are statistically significant because they're unlikely to have happened by chance. That just should make you think this requires further observation. And then practical significance asks the question, are the results worth acting upon or making decisions upon? Um, if you were about to make this bet and you observe that 90 times out of 100, the coin landed on heads. Would that be significant enough to affect whether you um, bet on heads or tails for flipping that corn, coin? Sure, it, it would affect your decision. So that particular example has both statistical significance and practical significance. Let's look at some examples. We're supposed to determine whether the results have statistical significance and also determine whether they have practical significance. Number 13, in a study of the Marissa Weight Diet, four subjects lost an average of 45 pounds. It's found that there is a 30% chance of getting such results with a diet that has no effect. To answer the question, are those results statistically significant? You only need to look at the probability of getting those results by chance. Is 30% highly unlikely? Not really. It happens about a third of the time. So those results aren't statistically significant because they're not unlikely to happen by chance. Not st statistically significant. I'm going to just put no for the first question and then what about practical significance if you found out that a certain diet or for a certain diet the average person using the diet lost 45 pounds is that enough weight loss to cause you to decide whether or not to be um, involved with that diet plan now, this question is not about the likelihood of it having happening by chance. It's about would the 45 pounds be enough to cause you to act? And yeah, that's a pretty significant weight loss. So even though these results do not have statistical significance, they would have practical significance. 45 pounds is a pretty good um, weight loss. Number 14, in a, gender, in a study of the gender aid method of gender selection, a thousand users of the method gave birth to 540 boys and 460 girls. There's about a 1% chance that such extreme results would occur if the method had no effect. Again, the question of statistical significance just looks at that 1% chance. Would you say 1% chance is unlikely? Well, we're going to have an official definition of unlikely later, but for right now, I'm going to say 1% is a sm pretty small chance. 1% is unlikely. It doesn't happen 99 out of 100 times. So if there's only a 1% chance of those results happening by chance, then yes, those results are statistically significant. Now, think about the other part of the problem. Gender selection, I would guess that that would be a very expensive process. It would involve um, genetic manipulation. So it's going to cost at least hundreds of dollars, if not thousands. Um, would you make that investment if you knew, let's say you, you wanted to um, have a son and this method was going to increase your chances of having a son from the expected 500 out of 1,000 to 540 out of 1,000. If I'm going to invest thousands of dollars, that's really not a significant um, 
it's not significantly increasing my chances of having a baby girl, excuse me, baby boy. <laughs> um, so even though those results are statistically significant, they would not cause me to act and to um, participate in that gender selection method. Just didn't increase my chances of having a boy very much. And then number 15, when making random guesses for difficult multiple choice questions with possible answers of A, B, C, D, and E, we expect to get about 20% of the answers correct. There are five choices, so if you close your eyes and pick, you've got a 20% chance of your pick being right. The Ashton Prep program claims to have developed a better method of guessing. In that program, guesses were made for 100 answers and 23 were found to be correct. There's a 23% chance of getting such results if the program has no effects. Just look up at the chance, the probability that this would have happened by chance is 23%. 23% not very unlikely. That's a fourth of the time, approximately. So those results do not have statistical significance. They're not unlikely to happen by chance. How about practical significance? Maybe you have to pay $100 to participate in this program. You had a 20% chance of guessing the right answer. After this program, you're going to have a 23% chance of guessing the right answer. Um, would that make you sign up for the program? Pay $100? I don't think so. My chance of guessing correctly only went up from 20 out of 100 to 23 out of 100, and that is not a significant gain.